Thank you. Thank you, and uh, what a great meeting we've had so far. And uh, Anachi has brought the word of the Lord to us and has guided us, and, and that word has guided us in this meeting. Uh, I love the truth that God doesn't extinguish the fire, but keeps us in the midst of it. And that's a tremendous promise, isn't it? Um, what a blessing. And it, the whole uh, time of worship, those choruses came fresh and alive to us this morning. I was very blessed. And I say that partly because what I, when the Lord brings a word through a meeting, it may not always come through the preacher. It can come through like Onahi has brought a word. Don't lose it. Let that word, if that's the word of the Lord to you, don't let it go. And uh, <clears throat> so I want to turn you this morning to the Gospel of Matthew and to chapter 11. And uh, I'm going to uh, hopefully, if, if time permits, concentrate particularly on the last uh, six verses uh, of this chapter. And those six verses are a tremendous promise of wonderful blessings to whoever repents and believes in the Lord. And uh, I, I do um, believe this morning that no matter what problem anyone is facing, the Lord not only will uh, help us conquer that problem, which is a negative, he will get us out of that problem. But he also has wonderful things for us. So it isn't just that he, um, he can heal a wilderness, he can turn it into a Garden of Eden. And uh, that's really what we come to at the end of the chapter. I want to go through the whole chapter very briefly, the whole chapter 11 very briefly. Um, the chapter is divided really into uh, four sections. If you look at chapter 11, if you've got your Bible open, you will notice that this is one day uh, and one event. It tells us that um, at the beginning that John the Baptist was in prison and he sent his disciples to ask Jesus whether he was the Messiah. And uh, it, Jesus answered in verse 4, then in verse 7, as the disciples of John departed, Jesus began to say to the multitude. And then in verse 20, then he began to rebuke the cities uh, in which most of his mighty works had been done. And then in verse 25, at that time, Jesus answered and said, so you have Markers in this chapter that tell you that this was all one event, one they all linked. So Jesus began this chapter by answering the question of John the Baptist, and he ends the chapter with this great promise and invitation. And I want to come to that promise and invitation. So let me go through the four uh, sections of this chapter. Section one. John the Baptist, in prison, sends his disciples to express his doubt. And Jesus answers that doubt. Section two, Jesus commends John the Baptist and speaks some wonderful things about his life, and uh, which we can look to and, 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 and uh, look up to and say, Lord, I want some of those qualities in my life. And then in chapter, and then in verse 20, he turns to consider the cities around him of Capernaum, and he utters quite a strong condemnation of the cities of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And then finally, he gives this promise of tremendous grace and blessing to those who will come to him. So four sections and united by uh, a number of points. And I will bring out one point in particular in all four sections, that is the point of repentance, the need for repentance. So let's begin 
with just looking very briefly at this first section, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was in prison. He was in prison, we believe, uh, on the eastern side of the Jordan River in a fortress of Herod, one of the many of Herod. And it was there that he was imprisoned. He was obviously free to have visitors, even though he was behind bars. Visitors could come and speak to him and share with him, bring him food, whatever. And uh, when they came to him one day, John was obviously quite down. Um, I don't know what his mood really was, but he was doubting that Jesus was the Messiah. And we wonder why was he doubting? Um, I think possibly because he had been uh, perhaps expecting that Jesus as the Messiah would bring so much power and liberation. But now John was, from the very beginning, he was in prison. He was in prison very early in the time of, in the ministry of Jesus. And Jesus not only didn't set him free, but he didn't even visit him. I mean, what kind of pastor doesn't visit somebody in prison? But I mean, there you go, poor John was on his own. He also knew the promise, promises and the prophecies of the new covenant. And he knew that something greater was going to happen. And of course, that was something he didn't live to see. That would have been the day of Pentecost. And uh, he, he didn't live to see that. But let's, let's just look at a verse because when when, John, when the disciples, he said, to, he said to his disciples, go and ask him, are you the one or is there another one coming? And so the disciples walk probably a day or two. They cross over the Jordan, go north to Galilee. It must have been a three or four day trek. Um, they get to Jesus and they bring the doubt of John the Baptist. Jesus said, in verse 4, go and tell John what you see and hear that I'm doing. And he said, the blind, look at them. I'm opening their eyes. They're being healed. The deaf hear. The lepers are cleansed. The lame are walking. The dead are raised. Now, from this list, you realize that the Gospels only give a selection. All the Gospels together only give a selection of what Jesus did. The poor have the gospel preached to them. So these two disciples of John, must, their jaw must have dropped as they saw all these signs. And Jesus said, go and tell John what you've seen. And um, John knew the scriptures. He knew that in Isaiah 35, this is prophesied. And also Isaiah 61, the tremendous prophecies of the Messiah who will heal the broken heart and do all these wonderful miracles. And here the disciples would have confirmed it. What a tremendous fulfillment of prophecy. And Jesus then said this and tell him, and I'm sure they must have said this specifically to John, tell them, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And you have this awareness that Jesus spoke that word of knowledge to John the Baptist. He was an ordinary man, like passions, just as we were. He was of the spirit and power of Elijah. But the Bible tells us Elijah was a man of like passions, like as we are, similar temptations. And John was being tempted to be, to be offended. It is easy for Christians to get offended feeling that God has let them down. Why hasn't God come and let me out of this prison? Why hasn't he stopped this whole process that's leading to a fiery furnace? And uh, in, in John's case, he was executed. There was no deliverance. How can God do that? How can God allow these things? And there is this danger of offense. And of course, one of the interesting things is that Jesus Christ is, and this is also in Peter, we had that reading from Peter, um, but what Jesus, it says in, in, in 1 Peter that Jesus is a rock of offense. He's an offense. And 
we all have to admit it we've all at some point in our lives been offended by the gospel as we were coming to christ why because the gospel actually tells me my lifestyle isn't right and that's offensive to some people it's very very hard to i mean a lot of people um re reject the offense and rather say no my lifestyle is okay and you find this uh, spreading that people are justifying their lifestyle and even saying, well, Jesus will forgive this. And Jesus is acceptable to Jesus. Even though there are, there, the lifestyle of every human being is offensive to God. That's what God says. We are offensive to God by our life. We have offended God. We have offended his holiness. And God says, you have to change your lifestyle. There are elements about you that i'll have to change now in 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 a sinner's case that means they must repent to be saved in john's case it wasn't that he would have not been saved if he hadn't repented of this offense but he would not have enjoyed the 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 blessings that god had for him that we'll come to in a moment you see there is always going to be uh, an element of rebuke in the gospel even if it spoke as lovingly as possible, we have to repent. We have to change our mind. We have to humble ourselves and ask God for forgiveness and mercy that we may go on. And not only once, but in our walk. Some Christians get offended with God. I've known people who, who prayed and they feel God didn't answer their prayers and they got into difficult times and maybe their business or they lost their job and they say, oh God, how did you allow this? And they they go into some kind of huff and sometimes this can last for weeks even in some people's life for years it's a terrible affliction because when we're offended it is our pride and here john i'm sure in his tenderness and his readiness to he just wanted he was reaching out i love it that john the baptist was honest and reached out to get an answer and he got it and uh, he humbled himself, I'm sure, and um, he took it and turned to the Lord. Jesus then commends in the next section, he then speaks positively of John the Baptist. He says he's more than a prophet. And I, when I read this, I want to be a prophet. Now, I'm not saying that I want something great for myself, but the Bible says if anybody wants spiritual gifts, let him seek rather to prophesy. And to be a prophet is a tremendous gift to the church. It's a tremendous blessing forever. I want it for myself. I want it for you. I want all the Lord's people to be prophets. But when I read this, I realize there was a ruggedness about John the Baptist. Jesus said, did you go to hear somebody in soft clothing? No, he had a ruggedness. And I think of what we heard about Daniel in chapter one from Josh, there is a self-denial. There is a ruggedness. And if we will go that path, we'll go that route, we will have a message from another world. John the Baptist, living in the wilderness, denying himself, got in tune with the kingdom of God and was prophesying from another world. That's what we need. That's what a prophet is doing. He's not in tune with this world. He's in tune with another world. And his message was of repentance. That was his great message. And uh, it tells us that uh, in verse 12, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And I love this description of the message of John by Jesus. Jesus says this great prophet, he, he spoke and the violent and of course he's not referring to shaking god and pushing your way into the kingdom no one can push their way into the kingdom the only violence you and i can can exercise is violence against sin and pride and uh, 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 things in us that are offended it is astonishing that there is a way of healing and escape from terrible problems but the, the the only way is to humble ourselves radically and before the lord that's what john himself had done and i'm sure he 
This was what he did in response to the word of Jesus. And it's what we must do, be radically ready to humble ourselves and, and count ourselves as nothing. That reveals to us the great problem that is so often hindering people is pride. Marriages suffer because of pride. People's relationships collapse into terrible stress because of pride. And the answer is, if you're offended, if you're struggling, if you are uh, in pain, get down in the dust before the Lord. Humble yourself. Do violence to, 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 to pride and, and self. And if you do, you'll find the door is open. The door is low, but the door is open. And uh, so that was his description of, of uh, the ministry of John the Baptist. Of course, at the end of that description, it says that uh, people said of Jesus that he was a wine bibber and a glutton. So Jesus was obviously um, behaving in an apparently different way, that he was obviously sitting with sinners and eating and drinking with them. But don't let that disguise to you the fact that Jesus was as rugged as John the Baptist. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man had no nice bed, no slumberland mattress, no lovely uh, duvet, no nice pillows. He, he was a rugged man. Jesus Christ himself was rugged and he himself spent time in the wilderness and it was because of that deep ruggedness of character that he could go into situations and um, identify with people and bring God to them. Every prophet has that rugged side to him and we don't want uh, lots of cushions and easy things for our lives, we want prophets of a kingdom which is uh, of the crucified one, but also of the, the, the tremendous blessings that come through that. We'll come to that in a moment. So the, that's the second section. First section, he answers the cry of John the Baptist. Blessed is he who is not offended in me. Second section, he speaks positively about John the Baptist. Third section, he rebukes the cities of Capernaum and uh, uh, Chorazin and Tyre and Sidon. And the, the most surprising thing about this section, this third section, is that Jesus says there is one thing worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. It is blessings without repentance. And you can see, he says, woe to you, C Capernaum. He said, you're worse than Sodom. And uh, Sodom had a rebuke you know all that went on in Sodom, and there is a rebuke that lifestyle is wrong. It is an offense to God, and they had to repent. But they didn't. But Capernaum didn't have any of those sins of Sodom. They had respectability, religiousness. They had tremendous revival, but they kept self on the throne. And Jesus said, in the face of all the blessings and the miracles you've had, and yet you will not deal with this problem of self and pride. You're worse than Sodom, and you will suffer a worse fate. And you have here this tremendous burning rebuke of the Lord against both Sodom, yes, but much more against religion as a covering for self and sin so when we look at our lives and we see we are impatient or angry or or um, offended or all these they're all an indication that we need to humble ourselves and get right with the lord well that's that's quick overview of the early part of the chapter the first three sections of the chapter and i want to get to what i think is the the center and, the mo and some of the most important, beautiful verses we could ever read. Let's read these verses from verse 25. At that time, this is the time he's been speaking about these things. At that time, Jesus answered 
and said. He's answering all this. And he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, and you have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you an ocean of peace. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And now you see, we've come on to much different ground. We're on to really positive ground. He's not talking about uh, getting rid of bad stuff. That's what we've heard so far in repentance, getting rid of the bad stuff. He's talking about what's going to happen positively when the bad stuff has gone. Now, there's a verse, it's back there in uh, Genesis. I was just looking at it in preparation for this. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? They're talking, he's talking, of course, to Abraham and Sarah about the birth of Isaac. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah was barren. She was in menopause. <laughs> Not only has she been barren all her life, the barren now had turned to another stage. She was in menopause. She was old. She was past childbearing. And Abraham was 100 years old. And it was impossible. Is anything too hard? But when I looked at the Hebrew of that word hard, I, 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 had, I was surprised. I was quite shocked. The word hard is actually... Um, only it only gives you a part of the word. The word in the Hebrew is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is, is there something wonderful that God cannot do? And it wasn't saying, is it too hard? You know, we think of hard things. He was saying, is there something really wonderful that God wants to do for you that he can't do? And you suddenly realize that God is saying, I am not just going to bless you by taking bad stuff out. I am going to do something so amazing, so wonderful, you will pass on into another world of light and joy and blessing. This is important because freedom from sin is not possible by just concentrating on sin. <laughs> Freedom from sin is by getting into these positive blessings of the Lord. Is anything too wonderful? Now, is it hard for God to break a sin, to change a character, to heal a marriage, to um, whatever it is, to heal a heart, a wounded spirit? You know, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Whatever your situation, whatever your problem, whatever your grief, whatever your sin, your misery, your shame, whatever it is, there is nothing too hard for the Lord. But let's put it another way, because that's, God's going to deal with that in a moment of time. But more than that, he's going to replace it with something so wonderful, so there will be no room for desires to go back to those things. If God doesn't fill us with the, this fullness that we read in these verses, then we're, we're, we're going to be just like, we got rid of that, but we're going to drift back. The power 
of God is in giving us wonderful blessings that are so infinitely better than all the, the shallow blessings of earth and of sin. What are these wonderful blessings? Well, here they are. Let's read the first one. It's in chapter 25 and it's in the, it's, in, it's actually in the first three verses, 25, 26, 27. Those three verses describe something wonderful when God reveals himself. Now, I want to tell you that the, the most blessed position of any person is to receive revelation from the Lord. If you get a moment of revelation, your life will be transformed. Revelation is not information. I can give you information. Only the Holy Spirit can give you revelation. This is something that comes by grace. You can't earn it. You can't be too bad for it. And you can't be good enough for it. It's a gift. It comes through faith. If you will believe God, there's nothing too wonderful for him. He will give you revelation. He will give those wonderful things to you. And that's the force of the word he spoke to Sarah. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? You can have a baby, Sarah. And uh, she, she laughed. And, because it, uh, and it was at that moment, I think, that she came to faith that God was going to bless her and make her ridiculously happy. I mean it. There is blessing indescribable in Christ. And he said, revelation. You see, revelation comes to the person who can humble themselves like a child, throw away things, their self-importance, and come humbly and say, Lord, I need, I need your revelation. And only, no one is intelligent enough to get revelation. You can't get a degree in revelation. You can't get, you can get, you can study the Hebrew and the Greek and the, you know, I, I'm a linguist and I spend all these years learning languages and then you realize it doesn't help you get anywhere. Of course it does. It's nice to know the languages. But they don't, they're not, they're not a substitute for revelation. You get that on your knees before the Lord. You get it when you turn to him and receive from him. And this is the point you get. Jesus is saying, I want to give you something so beautiful. So what is it? It's the revelation of God. He says, knowing the Father and knowing the Son. Now, no, those phrases, knowing the Father and knowing the Son, are contain depths of undescribable blessing if i could show you the father you would see a life that is so pure so loving so powerful so transforming when you get into the presence of god you are in the presence of one who changes everything about you to understand who god is is the key to to, to life the person who has known that Jesus is Almighty God is already on track for eternal life. It's, it's that place when you see him and you, worship, you, are, you become a worshiper, but you're not conscious of all that's happening because you're conscious of one who is greater and you are set free from self because of the greatness of God. Purity is possible because God is so pulsatingly, powerfully pure. It's all in him. There is unstoppable love in God. And it's all, this is the blessing, that they may know the Father and know the Son. That's the, that's the first blessing. It's grace. And you have to get down on your knees, metaphorically, I don't know how, you, don't make yourself uncomfortable. But the point is, humble yourself and God will pour in this uh, tremendous blessing. And then he says this, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I know all the burdens you're carrying, all the crushing uh, loads, all the, you know, if, if, if you, you realize this, that if you wanted to be a marathon runner 
and that is the Christian life. You, I, I've never, I've done a half marathon, but if somebody said, here's a 20 kilo suit, suitcase, do it with that, I would never have been able to do it. And it's like marathon runners or athletes, footballers, soldiers in battle, all of them, they discard everything that is unnecessary. You can't do this carrying burdens. And Jesus, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. You've got worries and fears crushing the life out of you. You're under a burden of, a crushing burden of guilt and shame and, and darkness and self. He says, come to me, all you who labor. You're struggling. You can't make it. You can't make it through another day. You don't know how you're going to do it through this week. He says, you come to me, all you who labor. And he's not talking about just a little, you know, I wonder where I, where I, whether I'll be able to afford that. That new he's not talking about those worries he's talking about the crushing burdens of life people who can hardly see for the darkness that there's no light in the tunnel for them he says come to me you're crushed he says come just come as you are come and and, and as you come i will knock that burden off your shoulder he just wants to say to you you see that heavy load let me knock that off you. It's 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 as if, you know, you come to the Lord and there's a there's a scorpion on your shoulder. You say, just let me brush that off, and let me there's a spider there. Let me brush that off, and then he'll do it. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden. I'll knock all these burdens off. They'll roll away. You remember Pilgrim when he got to the cross. And he had a heavy burden on his back. And uh, as he got to the cross, he knelt there and his burden rolled off his back, rolled down the hill and entered a cave and disappeared. Isn't that wonderful? Well, that's what he does. The burdens will go, but in their place will come an, a, an ocean of peace, a tremendous rest. Who can describe? The end of worry, hurt, burdens, doubts, fears, just gone and replaced by an ocean of rest. Jesus Christ is peace. He is our peace. And if we can simply surrender and let him be our peace, it's like entering the Garden of Eden. There is a place. So, there is a hope so sure, a promise so secure, a life. It's in Christ. And uh, yeah, we just have to get there and let him be himself to us. So revelation, get on your knees and pray. Oh Lord, I want, I want the scripture to be a spark taken by the Holy Spirit and open my eyes to know God. This wonderful, beautiful, he is the definition of beauty. I want, as I come, my burden's gone and peace takes its place. And then the third blessing, take my yoke upon you. And uh, learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this uh, third blessing, we've got revelation, we've got rest, and now we've got a yoke. A yoke? How is this a blessing? Well, the answer is because he's saying, I want to be joined with you. I want to, to you know, when you, what is a yoke? It's not an egg yoke. I know some of you don't know anything about farming. It's not an egg yoke. It's a yoke of an oxen. It's a big piece of wood over two oxen uh, leading together. And uh, if I were to um, carry a piano, um, uh, I would, I, I'm not very strong, got a bad back. I would want 
to carry a piano with, I don't, I, I'd actually like to, a team of two or three people who are really strong, but I want them to carry it so much that all I have to do is just to pretend to carry <laughs> because that's what it is with Christ. When you yoke with him, he says, let's carry this load together. Now he can carry a piano in one hand and he can carry all my burden. He says, let, let, let's, do, let's get joined together in this process of your life. Let's carry, let's walk together in this life. I'll carry the burdens and you can just hang from the yoke, if you like, and swing from it. <laughs> that's, that's what it means. I want you to get in step with me to walk through life yoked with me. I want you to get in step with God. And Jesus is ruling the universe. We're not going to carry his yoke, but he says his yoke is easy. His burden is light. How is it easy to carry the whole universe and all the problems of the whole world? I mean, I hear problems. I can't, I find I, I can't carry them. Well, I'm not meant to, but he can carry all these burdens. He is almighty God. And he says, just get into step with me. And this third blessing is, come on, just join yourself. Let's get into close relationship. I want you to get into step with me i want you to walk at my pace i want you to walk at the pace of grace i don't want you to rush ahead to think i i want you to set the pace i want you to know that i'm setting the pace and i want you to watch me and i want you to feel my strength through the yoke i want you to feel the power that's holding up your burdens and you and everything about you and uh, I remember when my son was about uh, three or four years old, he helped me carry a heavy piece of wood. He wanted to help his dad doing a job. And I carried this piece of wood and he held one, the front end, I held the back end. Actually, I was in the middle. And he held on, it looked very important. And uh, he was helping dad. And then I lifted up the plank and his feet left the ground. <laughs> and, but he was still helping his dad. And that's how it is to be a, a fellow laborer with Christ. He's wonderful. Now, these three blessings, revelation, peace, and to be in step with Christ, to have that consciousness that you're not setting the pace, he's setting the pace. You can let go. You know, some people are so afraid of letting go because they're afraid. What will happen? I've got to keep this going. I've got, to, I've got to put all my stress and strain into it. And Jesus says, well, you're actually going nowhere. And you're carrying all the burdens. Just let go. Let, become conscious of me, my grace, my presence, my help. And you'll be helped. So look at the whole chapter again. And you've got this theme of repentance because he says, John, d don't get into a huff about this. You, yeah, your life may not be easy, but come to me, John, all you who labor in a heavy laden. I'll give you rest, John. And Sodom and Gomorrah, if you'd only change your lifestyle, I'd give you rest. I'd give you revelation. I'd give you peace. And I'd, I, and, and Capernaum, you've been blessed, but you haven't let go of yourself and your pride. But if you do it, I'll give you, come to me, everybody. He's not just saying, come to me if you're good, or come to me if you're prayerful, come to me if you've got a lot of faith. He said, just come. Everybody, come. I can carry you. He can carry the whole world, and he can certainly carry you. He can carry me. Our Savior is wonderful. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said to us, come. And I come. I come first for myself to look at you. I need this grace of revelation. I need it. I need peace of heart in the midst of storms, in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. I need peace of heart, and I need to know you walking 
beside me or me rather walking beside you. I want to walk with you, Jesus. I want to feel your strength carrying things. I pray it for myself and I pray it for all my brothers and sisters. Oh Lord, if there's anyone whose lifestyle is an offense to you, let them come right now and come through to peace. Let them do violence to pride and self and find peace. I pray it for everyone, every one of us. Bring us into this wonderful place of walking with Jesus. You are beautiful. Show us a glimpse of your glory. Open our eyes to know you. It's only by your grace and you want to give us it. It's your desire and we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.